we'd like to welcome David Horowitz. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about stop complaining and start learning. We, we're really pleased that you've been able to join us. You're coming to us from the States today, but early in the morning for you. Um, but um, we're pleased to have you with us. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, both really pleased and also very frustrated. I'm pleased because I'm here talking with all of you about one of my favorite subjects in the world, retrospectives. And I'm a bit frustrated because I was very much hoping to make my first trip to India back in March. And so unfortunately, of course, that didn't happen and I'm here virtually. Uh, but in any case, just thrilled to be talking about one of my favorite things in the world, which is retrospectives. Uh, so a little bit about myself before we dive in. Uh, so I am the CEO and co-founder at Retrium, a platform that helps you run better retrospectives. Um, so quite literally, retrospectives are my day-to-day. -day. Um, we build software that has to do with retrospectives. I think about them all the time. Um, and really, it's one of the top loves of my life. I find them incredibly important um, and maybe only second to my family. So I have a wife uh, who I met when I was in my young 20s and four little kids, um, eight, six, four, and one. So I'm quite a busy guy. And at any point in time, because I'm home, uh, they could be running in through that office door over there and interrupt everything. And I love when that happens. I think it's great to incorporate them into my life and my work. So just word of warning, they may appear at any time. Um, but besides them, retrospectives really are that important to me. So why? And that has a lot to do with the fact that I firmly believe that retrospectives are the catalyst, the core of true agility. Why? Well, if you ask yourself, what is agile in just two words? To me, it would be very simple. Agile is continuous improvement. That's it. Now, many of us understand that intuitively when it comes to product development. We make the product better over time, incrementally and iteratively over time. But when it comes to how do we communicate better together? How do we work better together? How do we have a better process so that we can deliver value faster? Then the question is, well, how do we do that? And the retrospectives are the meeting that catalyzes that process. In fact, if Agile is about continuous improvement, and you aren't running retrospectives, or you aren't running effective retrospectives, I would ask, are you even really agile in the first place? So to me, that's how core they are to everything we do as agilists. And I saw some people giving that little thumbs up icon. I love the feedback. One of the things when you're in person is I can feed off the audience and get a sense of engagement, and it's much more difficult this way. So please give me that feedback when you like what I'm saying uh, so that I know that this is working for all of you. All right, so if retrospectives are the catalyst of true agility, what are they? Let's start with the basics really quick before we get into a bit more of the detail. So to me, the definition of a retrospective is an opportunity for your team to reflect on what has occurred and to construct ways to become better going forward. They're very similar in many ways to postmortems, uh, except that postmortems are run after the entire project or product is finished. And quite literally, the word postmortem means after death which to me made no sense at all. Why wait till after death to improve? Why not improve during life? And that's where retrospectives come in. The problem with retrospectives is that they are incredibly difficult to get right. They suffer from what I call the vicious cycle of retrospective disillusionment. That's a jumble of words and a mouthful, but I really love it. So I'm gonna say it again. The vicious cycle of retrospective disillusionment. And it goes something like this. So you run a retrospective and everyone on your team shows up. You have an interesting conversation and you come up with an action item that you want to work on in the upcoming iteration or sprint. Everyone goes home for the weekend and comes back Monday morning and they start working on building out the user stories, the product that they're supposed to be working on and completely forget about the fact that they had a action item from their retrospective. Well, now it comes time for the next retro at the end of the next sprint. And the question is how engaged will people really be in that meeting? Well, most people, if you're logical, actually won't be very engaged in the meeting at all. Because if the last time you ran them, it didn't lead to the continuous improvement that you're after, then why, logically speaking, why would you want to continue participating in a meeting that wasn't effective the first time? And so if you're not engaged in the next retrospective, of course, you'll have less of a commitment to follow through on the action item coming out of that retrospective, and so on and so forth down this vicious cycle where lack of follow through leads to lack of engagement in the retrospective and lack of engagement in the retro leads to lack of follow through. And you end up in this place where no one believes in the power of retrospectives, and then you either stop running them or you treat them as a checklist item neither which of which is a good idea. So this whole talk is focused on how do we break that vicious cycle? How do we get ourselves out of that sense of this doesn't work and therefore we'll stop being engaged in the meeting and into a much more positive environment, a much more positive mental state where we believe in the power of retros because they are working for us. 
So that's what we're trying to accomplish in this talk. To do that, I like to say that effective retrospectives rely on a triangle of sec success, three things. The first is people, the second is facilitation, and the third is follow through. What I mean by that is you have to get the right people in the room to have a good conversation. You have to facilitate the conversation so that you're talking about the right things. And then you have to follow through on the action items you come up with in order to get the continuous improvement you're after. What makes retrospectives so incredibly difficult is that if any one of those three things in your retrospective triangle of success is messed up, if you lose that one, you will likely fail. Just to give a concrete example there, imagine you got the right people in the room but you didn't facilitate the meeting in an effective way, then likely what will happen is the person who's most outgoing in the room will speak up first and whatever that person wants to talk about is what will be discussed. And so even though you might follow through on an action item, it might not be the right topic of conversation with the right action item because it wasn't an effectively facilitated meeting. Or to give one more example, uh, suppose you don't have the right people in the room, but you facilitate the meeting and you follow through on it. Well, if you didn't have the right people in the first place, will the team really be committed to the action item? Or maybe you won't be able to come up with a commitment because you didn't have the person in the room who would be the one who could follow through. So, and if you remove any one of these three things, you lose. And that's what makes it really, really difficult. So when we dive into how to break the vicious cycle of retrospective disillusionment, we're gonna talk about each one of these things. How do you get the right people in the room? How do you facilitate an effective retro? And how do you increase the odds you will actually follow through on the retrospective action item? Because I know for so many of us, that's where things fall apart. So let's go and dive in. Let's start with people. Rule number one with people, and this sounds simple and trivial, but perhaps is a bit not as trivial as you might expect when you dive in, is that retrospectives are for the team. So then it begs the question, who is on the team? Well, first of all, it's not your boss. Your team is not your stakeholders. Your team is not even your agile coach. It's for the team. So if you look at the scrum guide, you get a very clear answer of what defines the team. Um, and let's back up just for a moment and talk about where we get that from the scrum guide. So the scrum guide, this is a quote from it says, the sprint retrospective is an opportunity for the scrum team to inspect itself and create a plan for improvements to be enacted during the next sprint. So that's where we know that retrospectives are for the team. So who's on the team? According to the Scrum Guide, it's three individuals, the Scrum Master, the Product Owner, and the Development Team, the people who are actually doing all that work. That's who should be in the retrospective, which is an interesting thing because so many times I'll get a question like, should I invite my Product Owner to the retrospective? And of course, maybe there's edge cases where that might not be a, a wise idea, but in general, you've got to invite the whole team to have an effective conversation. In fact, I like to say that if you don't want to invite the Product Owner, then your team has some body odor. So if you don't want to invite the PO, you've got some BO. Because if you think about a developer, a developer might be familiar with the um, term code smell. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that before, but if you're an engineer or no engineers, you've likely come across the term. A code smell is just something feels a little fishy in the code. I don't know exactly what it is, but something just is off here somewhere. And we need to find out what it is. Well, similarly, I like to say this is an, a retrospective spell. If you don't want to invite anyone on your team, any single individual on your team, you have a little bit of a retrospective smell that's worth diving into because you really need all those people there to have an effective conversation. With that said, rule number two is completely ignore everything I just said. Ignore rule number one. And that's because of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, that 80% of the time, that's true. But 20% of the time, it might not be. Your boss? Your stakeholders, your agile coach, maybe they're the ones who should be in, in the retrospective. The thing is, it should be up to your team. If your team collectively and democratically voluntarily invites these individuals into the retro, thumbs up. It is perfectly fine for you to have those people in the room, but only when they're invited. The smell comes when your boss says, I need to be there with you or your stakeholder says, I need to be in that room in the retrospective. Because of paramount importance to the retrospective is psychological safety. And if the people in the room don't feel safe because someone outside the team is with them in the retro, they won't talk about what's important anyway. They won't open up and be honest. And then what's the point of the conversation? So 80-20, 80% of the time, just the people on your team, but 20% of the time, it's okay. Invite anyone you need to have an effective conversation. 
Okay, rule number three about people in the room is that you need a facilitator. Again, this seems so simple and obvious, but there's a lot of people who would push back against this concept. Stereotypically, and I can say this, of course, because I used to be a software developer for many years. Uh, I wrote code for about 10 years, so I am very knowledgeable of what it feels like to be on the engineer and development side because I lived it. You might say, well, that's, that's kind of silly. We can just talk about things. Why do we need a, the soft skills of a facilitator? Well, let's go through a couple examples of why that's important. Imagine there's low participation in the retrospective. Does anyone have, give me the thumbs up icon if anyone experiences this in their retro, where there's low participation, people just don't seem that engaged. Yeah, I can see all these thumbs up coming in, right? People stay quiet. And so you have to ask yourself, well, why? Why are people not speaking up? And if you don't have a facilitator, then there's no one to know how to handle that situation. So a trained facilitator might, for example, try a new retrospective activity. They might take a break. Uh, they might shift to breakout groups because sometimes some people feel comfortable in large group settings and other people feel much more comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one type conversation. So you could do breakout groups and then come back to the main group. There's lots of ways of shifting the conversation to increase participation. The best tip I can get, give you is if you have low participation in your retrospective, don't assume that you should try any one of these three things. For example, don't assume that a new activity will fix it. Instead, run a retrospective specifically on why there's low participation. Use five whys. Ask why again and again until you get to the root issue of why people aren't participating. And then you can find a solution to the problem. Otherwise, it's just throwing darts at the wall. Okay, here's another example of uh, why a facilitator can help. Sometimes you'll be talking about something, but really you're not. You're talking about many things at once. Different people are talking about different things, or there might be a perception that we're talking about one thing when the engineer over here is talking about X and the, the UI, UI person is talking about Y. Um, so how do you handle that? Without a facilitator, it's unclear, but a trained facilitator can do things like create a parking lot where you have a, a, a poster board or a whiteboard somewhere and you just put up ideas that we can come back to later. Um, you could name the different topics. Say, okay, um, you're talking about this thing and you're talking about something else. Let's name them and come back to them later. Now we have a way to refer to them. There's different ways that facilitators can handle this problem. So I could go on and on with the different situations that a facilitator, a trained facilitator knows how to handle. My point is, you need one. So the next question is, well, who? By default, everyone seems to assume it's the Scrum Master or maybe the Agile Coach. Thumbs up if that's you. Everyone on your team, your team is always facilitating these retros with the Scrum Master or Agile Coach. And by default, that's probably a good idea, but it doesn't always have to be that individual. There's no rule anywhere that says that it has to be the Scrum Master. So changing who facilitates, not just the Scrum Master or Agile Coach, but anyone on the team has three distinct advantages. The first one is it keeps things fresh, right? So I've been facilitating retrospectives for many, many years, but despite that, I only have a, a certain set of facilitation techniques that I am very comfortable using. It's quite a few, but there's only a certain set. If I bring someone else into the room to facilitate, they might have a whole new way of facilitating that's never occurred to me. So bringing someone else into the room to facilitate the retro provides fresh ideas to keep the retrospective interesting and engaging. Furthermore, facilitating in different ways helps people think, think, think about things in different ways. So broadly speaking, there are two types of retrospectives out there. There's the, the retrospective on the top left that you see, which is the Lego retrospective. It's the creative retrospective where you might draw something that represents how you're feeling about the sprint. Um, you might, if you're distributed, use an animated GIF to represent how the retrospective went, for example. It's creative things. You can use Legos to build a little set of figurines of how things are going. And certain types of people really resonate with that sort of retrospective. And then there's the other type of retro, which is very data focused. It's very analytical. It's looking at the data to say, with this in mind, what should we do next based on the actual hard facts coming out of the sprint? Different people resonate with different types of retros and different facilitators are really good at different types of retros. So make sure you bring people in who know how to facilitate these in different ways to engage different people in the room. Okay, the second thing is that it increases your bus factor. Thumbs up if you've heard of bus factor before, know what it is. Okay, I'm getting a couple of thumbs up. So the bus factor is the total number of people who would have to be hit by a bus in order to leave your project for dead. 
And a lot of times people think of this in terms of, you know, the star engineer, the person who just knows how the code works and can come in at 11 o'clock at night and fix something by 1130 because they just know it. They're the star, right? And if that person was hit by a bus, your project would be left for dead because no one else knows what to do. But in my mind, because of the central importance of retrospectives, it's actually true for you as well as a facilitator if you're the only one who knows how to facilitate a retro on your team. Because if retros really are the engine, the catalyst of agility, if the facilitators can't facilitate anymore, what are you going to do next? So spreading the, the knowledge of facilitation is a great way of increasing your bus factor. And then the last one is it gives everyone a chance to participate. If you're facilitating, you really shouldn't be participating in the same retro. It's hard. It's very hard to be both a facilitator and a participant at the same time. But that's a problem. Because if you remember one of the things I said very early on, the Scrum Master is part of the team. They're a member of the team. And so if they're the ones facilitating, then they shouldn't be participating, but they likely have valuable things to contribute because they're on the team. And so if you can't do both, what gives? By changing who facilitates across time, you're giving everyone a chance to participate in these retrospectives at various intervals. And that's very helpful. So that leads into what I just mentioned, which is facilitate or participate, choose one. You really can't do both at the same time. I was actually talking to one of the world's most experienced retrospective facilitators out there, and she was saying that even she struggles to try to facilitate and participate in the same meeting. It's not possible for her. Well, if it's not possible for her, for all of us mortals, it's not gonna be possible either. You have to choose one. So the only way that I have found to be um, a, way, a catalyst of, of facilitating and participating in the same meeting is by wearing a physical hat. What I mean by that is I will wear a hat that says facilitator on it when I'm facilitating the meeting. And the moment I want to participate in the meeting, I'll take that hat off so that everyone knows I'm not the facilitator anymore. I'm now the participant. And that's important because as a facilitator, you're supposed to remain neutral. You're supposed to give everyone in the room a chance to speak up and share their thoughts. By taking that hat off and saying, I'm now a participant, everyone knows you're not neutral anymore. Now you're going to be contributing your ideas and have perhaps strong opinions. Okay, rule number five, and this is the last one in the people bucket, the people part of the triangle of success. If one person is remote, everyone is remote. Now, this used to be a shocking statement back in the pre-COVID era. When I would give conference talks, people would say, ah, there's an audible gasp. I mean, what is that? How is that possible? If one person's remote, we still have a co-located team. It's not that shocking anymore. I think everyone now is more empathetic on average with the fact that remote team members are people too and deserve an equal voice in the room. So if anyone is, is remote on your team, the entire team is remote. Now, what's the implication of that? I'm going to skip a few of these slides. When it comes to retrospectives, let's think about if you're co-located. You wouldn't just have a conversation around a table. What you would do if you were co-located is you'd have flip charts and sticky notes and markers and different ways of engaging people through physical items, right? And so if you're distributed, it also is true that you need to reproduce those types of environments, but for your remote teams. So you can't just have a video call and call it a retrospective. You should use some physical uh, digital tool that represents the physical world. Now, all the way on the left, you have tools that are just general purpose collaboration tools, things like Google Docs, uh, things like Realtime Board, which is now Miro and others, that really it's just an open space to play, but it gives you a, a visual uh, manifestation of the physical world for your remote team, and that can help engage people. And then all the way on the right, you have tools that are more specific to retrospectives that have um, pre-built facilitation techniques. For example, if you want to run lean coffee, and you are a remote team, how would you do it? It would be quite difficult unless you had a tool that supported lean coffee out of the box. So that's where tools like ours, Retrium and GroupMap and others come in. Pick your poison. I'm not here to sell anything. I'm just trying to give you a sense that you have to use a tool of some sort to engage people in your retro. Otherwise, uh, you're gonna end up with just a conversation, which you wouldn't do if you were in person, right? So make sure that you don't fall into that trap. Okay, to recap the people part of the triangle of success. Rule one, Retros are for the team, but rule two is that use the Pareto principle, that's only 80-20 true. 20% 20 of the time, invite whoever you want in to make sure you have the best conversation that is you need to have. Rule three is use a facilitator. Rule four is facilitate or participate, choose one. And rule five is if one person is remote, everyone is remote, make sure that everyone has a chance to be engaged. All right, let's move on now to the second part of the triangle, which is the facilitation part. So let's go through the rules of facilitation. Simple, shocking statement, use facilitation techniques. Let me give you an example. 
So when I was uh, running this conference talk at a previous uh, conference when I was in person pre-COVID, um, I actually ran a real retrospective on the conference in the, the conference talk itself. And we had something like, I don't know, 300 people in the room. And I said, so how's the conference going? And I just stopped talking. And I let everyone sit there awkwardly thinking, well, how, does he want us to actually respond? Or is this just what, what, what's going on? And the point that I was trying to make was that if you don't facilitate you just open the question, how are things going? You're going to get awkward silence in your retrospective too. So don't do that. You need facilitation techniques. So I'm going to keep going here to this slide. Um, this thumbs up if you've seen this before. Interesting. Okay. So you know how in, in talks, sometimes people say, all right, here comes some, some thumbs up. Excellent. Um, if there's one thing to take away from a conference talk, you know how people say this, this is what it is. So for me, that's this slide. This comes straight out of Diana Larson and Esther Derby's book on agile retrospectives. If you're interested in retros, and by default, I assume you are because you're here and you haven't read this book, please do yourself a good service and go to go to your local bookstore, or Amazon or wherever, and go buy this book. It's kind of the, the foundation of everything else we know to be true about agile retrospectives. So in the interest of time, I'm going to breeze through this. I, don't, I usually go into more detail, but I don't have enough time to do that today. So there are five phases to an effective retro, according to Diana and Esther. There's set the stage, there's gather data, there's generate insights, there's decide what to do, and there's close the retro. Set the stage is a way to engage the audience. It's a way to make sure that people speak up once at the beginning of the meeting, because there's actually a lot of research out there that shows that if you speak up once in a meeting, you're more likely to speak up again. So simply by doing something like, hey, one word, everyone say how you're feeling right now. And people might say sad or glad or frustrated or enthusiastic, whatever the word might be. Simply by saying that one word, the research shows they're more likely to speak up again. So setting the stage it takes two minutes, but don't skip it because you'll end up boosting your engagement and participation as a result. All right, then the next stage is gather data where so many of us say, hey, what's going well, what's not going well? And that's our retrospective. But it turns out that if you don't gather data first, then it's very difficult to make sure that there's a shared understanding of what actually happened in the sprint before you dive into what's going well and what's not. For example, you could just post uh, up on the wall the burndown chart from the last sprint, or you could post up on the wall the list of bugs that were introduced in the last sprint. Or you could ask everyone to build out a timeline to represent uh, exactly what happened in the sprint. And x-axis is time. Everyone just puts up little sticky notes representing the events of the sprint um, so that you have a common set of data that then you can dive into analyzing when you move on to the next phase, which is generating insights. So in generating insights, after you've collected data, you're going to ask yourself, well, what's interesting about the data we just collected? Or what surprises us? Um, if you pick out something that is particularly interesting that you want to dive into, I mentioned five whys before in the talk. That's another uh, facilitation technique that fits right into generating insights. Five whys, if you haven't heard of it, it's one of the more basic facilitation techniques that I really recommend you use frequently, which is if you identify a problem, don't jump right to action item. Because a lot of times, if you do that, you'll only be solving the surface level issues. So instead, you want to ask yourself why five times or however many times. It doesn't have to be five until you get to the root cause of the issue that you're experiencing. And once you've found the root cause, only then do you try to decide what to do to build an action item? Because now you're solving the real problems and not the surface level issue. So that's an example of generating insights. Deciding what to do is building an action item. And then finally, uh, close the retrospective. The easiest way to close the retro is to do what I like to do at every conference talk that I give, which is please everyone provide me feedback because I want to make sure I get better next time. Well, if you're a retrospective facilitator, you should ask for feedback from your team. If there's low engagement in the room, Ask for tips on how to improve next time so that you don't make the same mistake twice. Fantastic way to close the retro. Okay, so that's basic facilitation when it comes to retrospectives. Rule number two is to zoom in on the dog nose, which of course, when you look at this, you're probably wondering what in the world is this guy saying? Is it too early in the morning for him in the US? What does that mean? So let me describe what I'm talking about. So there's this meme out there that was going around, I don't know, a couple of years ago, um, where there's said, zoom in on the dog nose, right? And so you'd say, what in the world? So you download the image and you'd you know, you use your computer to zoom in on the dog nose. And when you zoomed in, if you can see, it might be too small here for you still, but there's a little bit of white on the dog's nose. So you say, ah, man, I still can't read it. Let me dig in some more. So you zoom in more and it says, look in the bottom left corner. 
ah, okay, I just zoomed all the way in on the dog's nose. What, what's going on? Let me zoom to the bottom left. And so you'd go all the way to the bottom left corner of the dog. And now it says, look in the top right corner. Like, Man, what is this terrible meme? Is this going to go on forever? And so you, you keep zooming and, and, and panning until you get to the next thing. And now in the top right, it says, you are beautiful. And so by zooming in on the dog nose, you went from, hmm, it's just a dog, to a message, a hidden message, which was, you are beautiful. I promise this is going to connect back to retrospectives in a minute, but let me give you one more example. So many of you have probably seen the movie Finding Nemo. Um, I always forget. So I think they're looking for Nemo. I don't remember who, uh, who what uh, Dory or Dora, I think, is the name of the fish. Anyhow, I'm sure you've seen the movie and you know what I'm talking about. So they're swimming nicely in the ocean, right? And you're kind of zoomed in on them. And it looks like this great time. But when you zoom out, um, you actually realize that they're about to get eaten by this large shark. Uh, and so that's a little scary, right? So by zooming in or zooming out, you change your perspective on the situation. So what does that have to do with retrospectives? So many of us run retrospectives that are zoomed out, right? So they're this one. They're the, the shark with the fish picture. And we do that when we say, what went well, what didn't go well, or what is mad, sad, and glad right now? Um, and when that happens, we just have this broad perspective on the sprint. But there's another type of retro, which is the zoomed in retrospective where you talk about a specific topic and you dive deep on it instead of going broad. So one way of doing that is using something called Team Radar. A Team Radar just asks your team to rate themselves from one to five on different aspects of their work. In this particular case, we have collaboration, culture, technical skills and expertise and other things. And then you can average the results to build out this nice visualization that represents how your team's doing. In this case, the blue line represents average. And from this information, we can very quickly at the beginning of a retrospective discover that this team is struggling the most on scope and schedules, the lowest rated average. So let's run a retrospective just on scope and schedule. We've zoomed in on that narrow topic. And guess what? If we do that, we should start to see improvement over time on that scope and schedule. In fact, if we ran Team Radar again, maybe in a month or two, if that's not better than 2.0 average, then we're not doing our job in the retrospective. Hopefully, we're starting to see movement on that uh, on that number. Importantly, this is not a reporting uh, tool. This is not to report to your boss, to your manager. This is internal to the team to judge your own progress so that you know if you're if you're improving or not. So that's one way to zoom in on the dog nose. All right, rule number three is don't forget to facilitate open discussion. So no matter what facilitation technique that you use, inevitably you're gonna end up in a situation where there's just talk. People are just talking back and forth to each other. There's a couple of things here that trained facilitators do really well. Um, silence is your friend. Be comfortable with silence. Don't always keep talking and, and filling the gap. Sometimes silence is what will draw out uh, ideas from people in the team. Create invitations, don't force things. So for example, at the, I was talking about this conference where I gave this talk. I'll give you another example. Um, in front of 300 people, I said, hey, everyone, all right, if your name is Mike or Kim, stand up. And I was going out on a limb. I didn't know if there'd be anyone named Mike or Kim in the audience, but sure enough, about four or five people stood up. And so they were wondering what is going on here. Uh, and then I said, hey, now dance. And there's nervous laughter in the room and everyone was, uh, so Mike and Kim started dancing a little bit. I think one of them sat down. They said, no way, I'm not doing that in front of 300 people. But the point I was trying to make is that I just forced people into an uncomfortable situation, which was not very nice of me, but it's the same thing in a retrospective. If someone's being quiet and you say to them, hey, uh, Patricia, what do you have to think? What do you have to say? That is putting them in the same situation that I put Mike and Kim in. So instead create invitations, right? So you can say things like, who else has an idea? That's creating an invitation or any comments from someone who hasn't spoken in a while. You're inviting people to participate instead of putting them in an awkward spot. All right, and you can skip through a couple of these um, in the interest of time. So the three things here are use facilitation techniques, get familiar with Diana and Esther's book. There is a whole set of facilitation techniques that are really useful. Uh, zoom in on the dog nose. Don't always have broad retrospectives. Make sure you have focused retrospectives sometimes too, where there's a particular issue you need to drill into. And don't forget to facilitate the open discussion. Once you end up in open discussion, don't let it be a free for all. Still use facilitation techniques to make sure people are engaged. All right, let's move on to the last part of the triangle, which is follow through. So this is where it gets really tricky because Imagine you had the right people in the room, everyone was really engaged, you used a proper facilitation technique to pick the right topic, you had an amazing deep conversation, you found the root cause of the problem, you came up with an action item, you committed to that action item, but then you don't follow through after the retro is over. Well, guess what? You just wasted your time. 
So your job is not done when the retro is over. Again, one of the reasons why retrospectives are so incredibly difficult. So what do we do about it? Here's some tips to encourage follow through after the retrospective is over. The first one, follow the energy. All right, let's imagine you come up with an action item. What are the variables, if you're a math person, this will resonate with you. What are the variables that impact the odds of success on that action item? Or what's the expected value, the EV of the action item? To me, the expected value of an action item is a function of its impact. Right? Is this gonna have a big impact or a small impact on your team? The effort it takes to actually do the action item, right? Is it gonna take up the entire sprint or maybe just an hour of time? And then finally, the most important one, the odds you will actually do it. So if imagine you have a very high impact action item that takes very low effort. On the surface, it sounds like that's a fantastic action item to commit to. But if the odds are low that you will actually do anything about it in the sprint, the ev effective value of the action item is big total zero because anything times zero is zero. So if your team can't commit to something, if they don't have energy to actually work on it, it doesn't matter how big of an impact it will have, and it doesn't matter how little effort it will take. The expected value is zero. So how do you take, uh, take that uh, philosophical advice and turn it into practice? So imagine you are dialing deep into a, a topic and you are trying to figure out what action item to take. Well, you might ask your team, all right, everyone brainstorm action items that might work for this problem we're experiencing. And so the team will brainstorm and they'll come up with, let's say five to 10 action items. So visually, I'm gonna list them up on my board here. That's what these yellow stickies represent. I have a list of candidate or possible action items. Then you'll say, okay, everyone, let's figure out what is the impact of each of these action items. And we can use relative t-shirt sizing. It doesn't have to be exact. We're just trying to get a sense of relative to each other, what's the impact of each of these things? And so some will be large and some will be small. And okay, great. Now we have a relative judge of impact. Okay, let's judge effort. T-shirt sizing, some will be small, some will be large, right? And if you look at this, you might ask yourself, well, which is the right action item? Which is the one that we want to commit to? And so I can pretty easily scan through this list and see that their last one on the list has an extra large impact and an extra small effort. Sounds fantastic, that's the one we should commit to. But the next thing that we want to look at is energy. And you'd ask people on your team, put a dot next to the action item that you personally have the energy to work on in the upcoming sprint. Not that you think the team might work on, not that you think others might do, but you personally can commit to having energy to work on. And you, if you end up seeing that the one that you thought had the highest impact and the lowest effort, actually no one wants to work on, as in this example, that's probably not the right action item to focus on because the expected value is zero. It won't get worked on. Instead, the one that looks good here to me is the one with the highest energy. People are excited about that third one. And so that's the one that will actually get worked on. So we talked about the vicious cycle of retrospective disillusionment. One of the best ways to break out of that is to start building a muscle memory where you actually do what you say you're going to do. And the best way to do that is to figure out where do people want to be working? What do they want to do? And if they want to be fixing something, then fix it. Don't worry about if it has lower impact or lower effort. That's the right one for you. So this is a very practical facilitation technique that you can use to boost um, the odds of follow through in your retrospective. All right, rule number two is focus on one thing at a time. This is very simple. Once you commit to an action item, don't work on any more. Stop the retro right there. You have something you're going to work on as a team. That's good enough. Change is very hard for anyone. I don't care how much you agree with continuous improvement or how much of a core principle of life that is to you. As a, as a homo sapien, as a human, it changes hard no matter who you are. So only try to change one thing at a time and then stop, call it a day, and come back to the retro the next time and work on the next thing. All right, rule number three is to be smart. I Probably everyone here has heard of the SMART acronym for, ac for action items, uh, but it stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And basically all that's saying is when you write your action item down, even if you have a lot of, F, uh, of energy, people really want to work on it, it could be that there's two people have different interpretations of what actually the action item is. And so by making sure when you write it down, you are being specific and measurable and achievable and relevant and time bound, you're ensuring that there's a shared understanding of what the action really is, which will help um, figure that out in advance of the sprint in the retro, as opposed to waiting till later to discover that we had different interpretations of what this thing really means. So here are some examples of what that like might look like. I'll just go through one of them. The first one is, 
we might say, let's experiment with continuous integration as an action item, which fantastic, let's do that. But that's not a smart action item. The way to write that in a smart way might be, in order to release our product on a more frequent basis, that's the value, we will set up a continuous integration server before the end of the next sprint, that's the what and the when, and we will know that we are successful when commits to the code are automatically pushed to the continuous integration server. The bold words there is almost a template that you can use to translate any action item into a smart action item. So feel free to use that um, from the slides. All right, and rule four is that small wins are better than no wins at all. So, oops. Um, so has anyone here heard of 15% solutions? Thumbs up. If you have, it comes from uh, Liberating Structures, which is a, a wonderful set of facilitation techniques to engage the room. Feel free to go there. It's liberatingstructures.com. It's all free on their website. Uh, but the idea of 15% solutions is uh, when you're trying to come up with an action item, you might not be able to fix the entire problem because maybe it's a big problem that your whole company is facing. So reframe it to what's your 15%? What is the thing that you can do that will change just 15% of the problem. You won't fix everything, but you'll fix a small part. And sometimes that changes the people's mindset from one of I'm powerless and I can't fix this and I have no ability to change my working environment to, okay, I can't fix the whole overall problem, but I at least can fix some small aspect of it. What is that? So 15% solutions is a great way of doing it. And then rule five is to use the modified Vegas rule. So many people have heard of the Vegas rule, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And I've heard from many people that that applies to retrospectives too. So what happens in the retro stays in the retro. And I actually vehemently disagree with that. Now, let me explain what I mean. So it is very much true that you want to protect the psychological safety of the team in the retrospective. And therefore, by default, everything that happens in the retro should stay in the retrospective. But to me, that's not always the case. And the reason is, um, let me go back to this one. So the reason is, imagine at the end of the retrospective, you're talking about some really thorny, tricky issue. And you discover that hmm, we can't solve this at the team level. But if we could talk to the VP, the VP could likely fix the problem. Well, if you don't take that problem out of the team, out of the retro and share it publicly, transparently with the VP, it will never get fixed. So what happens in the retro by default should stay in the retro. But what I would do if I was facilitating is I'd open the retro by saying that, just so everyone knows what happens in the retro stays here, please don't share anything publicly. But at the end of the retrospective, as the facilitator, explicitly ask your team, what out of everything that we just discussed, should we share publicly and transparently with the rest of the company or with another individual? And if the answer is nothing, that's perfectly fine. But if the team from the bottom up voluntarily agrees that this thing should be shared, then share it. You need to, in fact, share it with others. So one um, passive way of doing that without having to go to the VP, if you might not feel comfortable with that, is to use what I call the retrospective radiator. We all probably heard of information radiators. This is a way of visualizing information like your burn down chart, so you know how you're doing. Well, the retrospective radiator is a flip chart that you can hang in your team room digitally or, or in person, um, where you put up things that the team has decided to share transparently with the org. Things like, what did we learn in our retro? Or things that if you want to learn more about this, come talk to us, we're happy to share. Um, or things like impediments that we're struggling with. Imagine if it's not just you, but every team in your org actually does this. Then you'd get this view into all of the impediments that the entire org is struggling with, which if you're a VP, that probably is really interesting to you because now you have this view into what are the problems that I should be aware of as a senior executive so that I can help fix them for you. So the retrospective radiator is a great way of, of pushing out information from the retro the rest of the company should know about. But keep in mind, it should be bottom up and volunteer. It's not everything goes on there. It's just what the team explicitly says uh, they want to put up on the radiator. David, you've got uh, five minutes to go. Perfect. I'm pretty much done. I had to get through everything really quick. So uh, because of the time, but all of that, if you put all of that into practice, you get the right people in the room, you facilitate the retro really, really well, and you end up with an action item that you can actually commit to and work on, you will change the vicious cycle of retrospective disillusionment into a virtuous cycle of retrospective success, where retrospectives lead to a feeling of employees having a voice and engagement follows from that, and the team starts to perform better, and it ends up being this truly agile world that we're all after. So I'm going to leave you with one slide, which is that 
the type of advice that I gave you today, if it was helpful to you, um, I write things like this all the time in what I call the Retrospectives Academy. Just scan that QR code or go to that URL. It's all free. You can just go to the website. Um, and there's lots of tips and tricks. And we're uh, in the process of writing a 12-chapter book, a full-length book um, that's free on the website. You can just take a look and, and read all these types of tips and tricks. And there's a lot more there, too, beyond what I talked about in the conference talk today. So feel free uh, to head on over. Um, and now I think I have five minutes left for Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Indeed, you do. And we have a quick few questions for you. Um, Aniruddha has asked questioning, a question on gathering data. If we show the burn down, won't the retro just be confined to problems in the burn down? Isn't that a little narrow approach? Yeah. So the burn down was an example of data that you could share. Um, you can certainly share any other data. Uh, the burn down is one. You could, for example, put um, the commit log into your Git repository. How many commits did we have? Um, you could put, for example, a, uh, a chart showing the amount of time we spent in different aspects of our work. For example, we were uh, in meetings for 20% of the time this sprint. Um, we were heads down for 25% of the time and so on. So you can analyze, are we using our time well? So it's up to you what data to share. Um, one thing you could do is share lots of data and then have the team dial in on what seems to be most important. But again, it goes back to that broad versus narrow concept, the zoom in on the dog's nose concept. So sometimes it's good to have a broad retro, and other times it is really good to have a deep, narrow retrospective based on just the burn down. Part of being the Scrum Master is having an understanding of the impediments the team is facing and picking the right retro technique based on that feeling. Wonderful, wonderful. Next question is uh, from Sakski. Uh, How can we get introverted people and in agile teams to express their opinion more often in a retrospective? Yep. Great. So uh, introverts, and this is, again, near and dear to my heart because, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, I classified myself as an introvert. I don't think of myself that way anymore. But at the time, I knew what it felt like to be an introvert in a group meeting. And so I know what I would have wanted. Um, and I also know through facilitating retrospectives, I have some experience on how you can draw out their comments. So here's a couple ideas. One is that Introverts have wonderful things to share. It's just that they don't necessarily, on average, feel comfortable sharing them in front of everyone verbally. So the verbally part is really important. If you include written communication in your retrospective, it can um, give an avenue for communication to, retro to introverts that they otherwise wouldn't have. So that's where sticky notes come in. Again, digital ones are fine or, or in-person physical sticky notes. Just have them write something down. Um, that can really help. Another thing that can help is to encourage people to add their ideas to the retrospective board in line with the sprint. So in other words, as they're working, if they discover an impediment that they're struggling with, load up your, your whiteboard or whatever you're using and write it down right then. So that when it comes time to the retrospective, you're not asking for people to think off the top of their head right then, what should I share? In fact, you've given them two weeks to share those things in written form uh, in line with their work. And that can really help introverts uh, in participating. I'll say one more thing, which is that breakout groups can really help. So a lot of introverts feel uncomfortable sharing in front of 15 people. But if you say we're going to do one-on-one -on -one conversations and then report back, in the one-on-one, -on -one, they're much more comfortable having a, a conversation. So alternating the, the how you facilitate can really help too. All right. Uh, next question is from um, Aniruddha. To, uh, question on generating insights. How, how, uh, using the five whys of each problem from each team member will take a lot of time. So what's the recommendation? Do we use the five whys for all the problems or only the complex ones? Yeah, so five whys is particularly useful when you're trying to figure out the root cause of an issue. Some issues don't need that type of analysis. It really is just a surface level issue. But I've always been surprised by how many times you think it's a surface level issue when it's really something deeper going on. So I recommend using techniques like five whys. It doesn't have to be that one. There's another one called fishbone and many others that help you figure out root causes. But yes, this does take time. And that actually is the point that instead of trying to have a conversation about 20 different problems in a retrospective where each conversation is 30 seconds long and you finish and you don't really you didn't really talk about anything useful, focus on just one thing, just the specific problem one time once in the retrospective and have a very detailed conversation about it. And you'll end up discovering an action item that is much more powerful and much more uh, impactful for your team. So yeah, it takes a while and that's a good thing in my mind. Next question, how much time is ideal for conducting a successful retro? Do we need to keep it time boxed? 
So um, yes, I would say time boxing is useful, if nothing else, than to keep people focused. The amount of time, it, it's a tricky one. You see all sorts of advice um, everywhere from one hour per one week of your sprint um, to many other things. But I, I actually find that that doesn't matter. What matters is you should take the amount of time you need to be effective in the conversation. So I would start with, let's say, an hour for your retrospective. And if that seems to be too long for your team, then you can shorten it. If it seems to be too short, you can lengthen it. Use your brains as a team to figure out how long you need. The point is that if the retrospective can turn into that engine of true learning and continuous uh, agility, then you're going to want to spend as much time as you possibly need to to have that effective conversation. So, um, you know, start with that hour or so and just bend it, change it, depending on what you discover. I don't find a hard and fast rule has been effective for me. Well, we've got time just for maybe two more quick questions. Um, we used to do, well, this is from Rohit, we used to do five whys exercise, but eventually with time it turned into the blame game sort of thing. How can we avoid this situation? Any tips to smoothly execute this exercise with the team? Yeah, so the blame game to me uh, is can certainly be the result of five whys, but the blame game can be the result of many different facilitation activities. Um, and actually, I should rephrase that. It's not the result of facilitation. The blame game is a result of a team dysfunction. And your team won't descend into the blame game if the team is functioning at a high level together. So uh, how do you get out of the blame game? Um, there's actually a fantastic book. Do I have, I think I actually have it here. Um, I don't know if you all can see, but it's called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. So I, I'm reading this book right now. I, I love it. Um, it is very different from any leadership or business book I've ever read. In fact, I'm usually very skeptical of this type of book because um, I find that people kind of just go on and on about things uh, and it's not practical or it could have been a blog post, right? This is one of the one only ones that I've read in years that I find to be incredibly insightful in almost every page. And one of the things it talks about is how you need to shift from a culture of blame to a culture of learning opportunity. And I know that sounds obvious or it sounds um, like, yeah, of course we need to do that, but it gives you practical steps on how to actually transition from blame to learning. Um, and so I, can't, I don't have time to get into all the details right now, but if you're really interested in leveling up your skills there, I highly recommend that book. It's a really good one. Um, again, just I'll put it one more time, 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. Excellent. Okay, one last question before we have to uh, wrap this up. Um, from uh, we've got quite a few people asking more and more questions now. Um, retro is often the skipped ceremony. People lose faith over a period of time, and it only happens just as a mandate. Any tips to overcome this? Well, I hope that the talk helped with that. that was, the entire point of the talk was getting out of that vicious cycle where it is a checklist item and people participate because they've been told that they have to, or you just skip them. And in fact, it's it makes sense to skip the retrospective if you've been doing them for a long time and they aren't working, right? I, I'm not advocating to skip the retro. Believe me, I, I, I love retrospectives. They're so core to who I am. But if you keep doing them the same way, and they're not working. The, the logical response, if you can't figure out how to improve them, is to not do them anymore because it's a waste of time. So people will just stop showing up or they don't pay attention. They'll open their email and their laptops. Like This is a logical reaction. So your job as a facilitator is to ask why. What can we do next time to make this a better meeting for you? Don't The mistake that I see many times is people just keep doing the same thing again and again. It's not working. That's okay. These retrospectives are just checklist item. I'll just run mad, sad, glad again next time. And then the same thing happens next time and it just keeps going and everyone gets more and more frustrated. So the whole talk was how, how to get out of that. Um, and I'm hopeful that some of those tips uh, will help you.